welcome to June's Inner Circle. Um, thanks for everybody for coming along and attending. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, can we, I'm just, I've got everybody up on my sort of Zoom board, so just a brief introduction, who you are, what you do, and how life is at the minute. Should we start with Janet? Uh, ah, hi. Uh, George, oh, it's Janet Smythe, and uh, I'm uh, in Lyme Counts, and been going now for four or five years, coming up. So, yeah, that's, yeah, very busy times, I'm sure all of you have appreciated, and, um, but yeah, all good. Nice to be here. Thank you. Mike? Mike, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, Mike Ainsworth from uh, Everett, Mastered and Furby has been born oh. shows. Um, I sell businesses. So basically EMF have been selling sell. businesses since 63. Anything we will sell um, from, typically we, we tend to sell smaller businesses. Uh, I also uh, value businesses and help people talking about their exit strategy because most people in exit strategy until the months before they want to sell. So uh, true. And, did, uh, did everybody say and come back there? Yeah, did did come back now, so. but I missed a lot of it, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Mike, right. so we've got Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I've got a really posh microphone. You should hear me. Uh, yeah. That's it, really. That's, otherwise, I'm blurbing on. Friday. Hi, everyone. I can hear some noise there. Um, I thought I phone just <laughs> I think most of you guys know me, who I am, what I do, but uh, you know, just for the benefit of the others. Chris, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on this inner circle. The case study you've given is spot on. Uh, for the benefit of everybody else, what I do is I'm a transitions coach. Um, my age profile of the clients are silver haired, low, no hair or gray hair. And I think that fits just some of us here. <laughs> And it's uh, something that Mike mentioned, exit strategy in life, you know, post-career, post-business, and what do you want to do uh, uh, moving forward? Now, we are in this time in the phase where we're going through the biggest transition in generations to be seen. And it's Paul put us into a situation where we're having to rethink ourselves, uh, every aspect of our lives, from relationships to health, to our business and our well-being. So, you know, exciting, exciting time for me. A lot of clients coming to me for, you know, those who are fearful, anxious, uh, wondering which direction to take. And, you know, it's just sitting down together, get your head screwed in and work out some fantastic opportunities to take on. Oh, cheers, Brad. Great place to be. Richard, tell us a little bit about you, mate. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. So I'm Richard from Connect Lifetime Mortgages. We're based in Upminster. Um, ultimately, what I do is I look after the over 55s to purchase refinance uh, a residential or a buy to let property these days um, so so um, and the other thing is that he's asked us about ticking over yeah we've been okay uh, during the quiet period um, or lockdown periods we've, we've been quite uh, sort of fruitful with some of the pipeline and we're still getting inquiries now and I think with uh, lifetime mortgages particularly possibly is recession proof uh, as an industry to a point um, so yeah, looking forward to meeting you and, and uh, carrying on. Cool, good stuff. Darcy, I'm sorry, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got to change this anyway. Am I on, can, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm not on mute, am I? No, we can hear you, mate. Um, yeah, Unfortunately. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Elliot, I'm a mortgage and protection advisor. Um, the industry's been quite funny over, over the last three months, really. Lenders, 95% loans of value pre-lockdown. We're into lockdown, they scale back. Um, some go maximum sort of 70, 75. Some dip their toe back in at 90 and then start the last week, they pulled from the market again. So uh, it's been quite interesting times, really. Uh, obviously the aim of, of, of my job really is, is to help people get finance if it's buying a property or, in, or investing in property and then make sure that property and the, the mortgage is fully uh, protected in the form of life insurance or quick group illness cover. Oh, cheers, mate. Thank you. Jacqueline, tell us a bit about you. Hi, everyone. Um, Jacqueline Hall, family business coach, focusing on organisations, helping them to um, understand their values, see how those impact their leadership of their business, and um, help them to think about their personal purpose as well. That's me in a nutshell. Um, also, to say I'm going to have to come out to come back in because the sound is um, getting us really bad. 
So I'm going to disappear, disappear for a few minutes and come back in. Okay. Fine. Yep. All right. Ian. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Ian Brasher from IAB Limited. What I do um, is I help businesses get better at, at what they do. Um, so as a consultant, um, I look at what, what a company wants to have fixed and, and maybe help them understand what they need to fix that they don't know about. Um, so to, to quote Toby, actually, uh, I help people know their unknowns. Remember that, Toby? <laughs> um, and, and then uh, help them to, to find resolutions. So uh, how they do things, how they structure their people, uh, how they uh, not get around that, but encounter the, the regulations and, and deal with them correctly. That's me. Very cool. Toby? Um, Toby Acton, Sales Masters Guild, uh, personal business mentor and trainer. Basically, helping business owners get from where they are to where they want to be um, and helping them get there in the fastest possible time and, and truncate that journey. Um, my, my mission, if you like, is to uh, inspire and educate and support business owners to help them get the uh, the wealth and the work-life balance that they started their business for because most never actually achieve it and end up working longer hours for less money, and less security and more stress than they ever had in a job. And I want to stop that. Yeah. I wonder how many business owners become an employee of their own business. It's an Absolutely. interesting one. It's, well, yeah. they're, they're not business owners. They're owned by their business. Sanjay, I'll tell us a bit about you, mate. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Sanjay <coughs> from iTech Solutions. Uh, I'm a charter certified accountant. Uh, well, I've been with this industry for the last 12 years. Uh, last year, I opened up my, my own practice. So I'm basically working with all the small businesses. Uh, and my healthcare sector, especially uh, pharmacy, community pharmacist, uh, optician. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, basically, thank you. And how is your, just one quick question for you, Sandra, how has your sector been, uh, what's been happening recently? Uh, well, yeah, it, it has some in, impacts. Uh, well, I would say uh, I have some growth and also lost uh, a little bit as well. Uh, well, in terms of growth, uh, that, uh, yeah, fees goes up a little bit uh, from, you know, these, uh, uh, advising all far low government related uh, helps but yeah at the same time some of the clients they're struggling well couldn't couldn't pay kind of you can say a balance situation for me okay John so it's a bit about you mate good afternoon everyone I'm John Charman uh, I'm a chartered accountant that's all I'm gonna say to you because you all love my life story when I come on here <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was expecting a bit more time there, John. But you've, uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, for each other. Um, right, okay. So, Kate, um, this month is Devon. Uh, Devon, sixty-four, and is considering what happens next with, with his life. Um, accepted an offer to sell his technology business. Um, and he's received an offer of £1.8 million for his business, currently in the final stages of negotiation, so he hasn't put pen to paper yet. He's looking at whether he should sell the shares or transfer the assets of his current business over and considering both options. Uh, Devon's wife, April, is um, in a, a small shareholder. They take small salary but no dividends in this current tax year. We've got the assets listed there, mortgage-free property of 800 grand, bit of cash savings, pension <coughs> assets um, of about 700K, investments of about 200K, and a rental property. Miles is considering whether he should invest in his friend Michael's business. Um, and Michael is opening a business uh, which is into nautical flotation. Um, and it, he hasn't got a contract yet, but he's, he's, he's sort of dipping his toe in the water. Uh, with the RNLI, Leisure Centre companies, but haven't gained a commercial contract at this point in time. They've got a 50-50 share, but no revenues. 
um, and they're the only two employers of the business and they're looking to navigate where they are in the business moving forward. Um, Devon was going to they need uh, but what he is interested in doing with this capital sum is seeing whether there's ways to invest it sufficiently <clears throat> and he's heard about VTTs and the IASs and stuff like that so um, that's certainly one route. Um, Devon and April have got some kits um, they've got simple wheels but no power of attorneys and April's mum is still around aged 82 currently in good health but April's concerned about care. Um, Devon's got the following objectives. He wants to ensure he mitigates as much tax as possible, doesn't want to maintain, uh, does want to maintain an involvement in business because he actually likes work um, and wants to carry on, but wants to get the right balance now between work and life and likes the idea of investing in Michael and Mitch's business but wants to do that tax efficiently. Um, and um, wants to make sure that his family is protected in the event of both his death and incapacity. So we'll do a bit of a round robin first on um, uh, the first question. What else would you want to know and what questions might you ask anybody involved in a case study um, to help you understand the case a bit better so you can help them? Janet, do you want to go first on that one? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, that, there's, there's quite a lot of information on here, so which is which is great. I think probably um, something that I might want to know is um, about his son, whether or not he had any interest in, in the business or not, because that could um, impact whether or not you bring them in sort of for um, inheritance tax purposes or, you know, things like that. So that, that might have had some influence. Um, I've also... I might want to know whether or not he, um, I know he wants, he's interested in this new business, um, but how, whether or not he might want to sort of stay at arm's length on that, if he wants to use his um, sort of um, enterprise investment sort of schemes and stuff, because once he's in it, it won't apply then. So that would be something else. I just want to know whether or not he wants to have, um, you know, just an investment uh, interest rather than a, um, actual sort of management interest in that. Um, I suppose really it's, it's, you know, knowing what he wants to do with his money. And so you can work out how much he needs sort of liquid and how much he doesn't, or, you know, how much he actually needs to live on. So I suppose, which is probably more your area to, to sort of work out. Um, yeah. Situation for that. Certainly, I think there'd be an element of work to do to work out what he needed for his core financial plan, yeah. which would then look at investing in quite a boring way yeah. um, to make sure that we knew that was done. And yeah. then having a pot of money to mitigate longer term tax and something like AIS, VZT, where yeah. particularly where the, where the company is a bit more volatile, exactly. he probably doesn't want to base his core financial plan on, but might have a pump. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Yes. Um, no, I don't think at this stage. I mean, I, I like to so say there's loads going on there. Uh, you know, there's all the R&D in the new company. It's whether or not he decides to, you know, if he sells the shares, it's capital gains. If he transfers the shares, there's, you know, there's different things there. I couldn't quite work out why he didn't take um, a dividend um, because that would just utilise that basic rate band. It's yeah. not going to affect any sort of capital sort of stuff. So I would have thought, and it's a way of get, getting some funds out of the company. So I couldn't quite work at this stage why you wouldn't do that. But no, other than that, I don't think there's any, any other questions that I'd have. Cool. Mike, what were your initial thoughts and what additional questions would you ask? My, my initial thoughts, I've got questions around the share or asset sale which is probably a very very straightforward answer he's accepted the offer so i'm assuming it's a fair offer i'm a business valuer so i'm kind of always going to go through my mind is is that a fair offer um and how is the deal structured is it is it cash on purchase or is it some element of deferred consideration because that's going to make a big 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 difference to the whole deal yeah <laughs> and, and on shares 
share sale or asset sale is something I'm asked. Um, in general, a share sale is better for the seller and an asset sale is better for the purchaser. Um, in this case, given the consideration is 50% of his assets are in, in his business and it's 1.8 million, it's almost certainly going to Oh, who's that? Kevin, can you... Hi, Joe. Oh, Kevin, can you mute, mute oh, your... Um... <laughs> now, let's listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> it might be... Real... Sorry, Mike, go on, off you go, mate. I think Kevin's muting himself. Oh, and Mike's muting himself. <laughs> <laughs> You think we'd got, well, you'd think you'd we'd have this Zoom thing down pat now, wouldn't you? Do you know I what think, I mean? It's just still. I think just building on from what Mike was saying, though, I think although I would have thought there'd be possibly two different prices depending on whether it was a share sale or an asset sale. Yeah, fair comment. Um, because and and the other thing is that there's a lot of sort of questions surrounding it, really, because obviously, yeah, we're we're looking at. A, we're potentially looking at entrepreneur's relief. I'd be asking, in order to be eligible for that, I'd be asking how much, are the, how much there's, uh, there are cash reserves in the company. Because I'm right in thinking, I think if you've got sort of over 20%, I can't remember the exact number, I think it's over 20% of the value in the company. If it's in cash, there can be questions surrounding whether it's, uh, whether it's a, a legitimate trading company or a sort of a, an investment company, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 rules, the rules typically are around nature of business. So if it's a property business, um, there's, can't do it. Um, uh, but also, are you selling the business as a going, like, as, a, as an actively yeah. trading yeah. business or is it a cash share? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of the other questions I'd be asking is, um, it says it says his wife April uh, receives a receives a nine thousand three hundred pounds salary, but does she actually work in the business? Uh, because obviously she owns twenty percent of that business, so there, there'd be um, there'd be entrepreneurs' relief to claim on on her part as well if she was working in it. Okay, right, Mike. Was there anything else you wanted to add, mate? No, I, I mean the. the we're talking about this particular case but generally when people come to me to talk about share or asset sale the company the sale size sale size is just far too small to consider a share sale the, the due diligence is going to cost you upwards of 20 25000 pounds even for a really small company to do a share sale um, and if you're selling it for 100 150 200 250 it's too much it. into it's it it's too much yeah. into it yeah i think that's a fair point actually yeah that, that that's fair um uh, but the in terms of Janet and John and Sanjar, in terms of the um, entrepreneur's relief, if it's an asset sale, does that still apply? It's, as long as it's a trading company, isn't it? Which this is a trading company, isn't it? Because it's technology being sold. Yeah. Um, and okay. Motor vehicles. There'll be an there'll be an element though of um, what the what the sale's made up of. I'm right thinking if there's a lot of it, if there's plant and machinery and some other bits and pieces, then that might, uh, there's, there's going to be court tax payable on that if capital allowances have been um, claimed on the assets. So, sorry, just to clarify, you're saying that you can get entrepreneur's release, relief if you're doing an asset sale? No. No. All oh, right, sale. okay, I misunderstood. Sure. I was going to say, because with an asset sale, it's the company that's selling, not yeah. the individual. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, because potentially the shell would have to still pay corporation tax on any gains made on the assets, right? Yeah, so you're uh, not double, double taxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so you've got to be careful with that. Okay, cool, that's good to clarify and we'll explore that. Just one thing, uh, there's, a few, there's a few new people that are on the call, so thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, now, Jacqueline, oh, Jacqueline's back on. Charlie, are you here, mate? I am here, mate. <laughs> Um, do you want to do a quick intro? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, I'll try and get my video on as well. My internet's been a bit funny. Um, what does I say? So I work with uh, with Chris and the team at Cervelo, um, and I do employee benefits and uh, employee reward and well-being. So my focus is really on uh, corporate clients and, and helping those businesses get value out of uh, looking after their employees. Um, 
I think you've given me quite a tough uh, case study here, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, mate. I, I always like to try and include everybody, but it, it's, it's often quite difficult. And Paul, can you introduce yourself as well? We've not met yet, have we? But thanks for coming on and joining us on Inner Circle. Paul? Uh, right, sorry. Yep. Can How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Can you yeah. just... Is that all right? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I'm a private client solicitor with um, F Barnes, so deal predominantly with wills, trusts, um, yeah, debtors, and um, yeah, so that's all really. <laughs> and thanks for joining us, we really appreciate it. So, no Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? He might still be on his call. He's still on his call. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to him later. Okay, no worries. Pradeep, what were your thoughts on the case study? Maybe he's talking to Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought Richard was. He's on the phone. Yeah. His microphone's on mute, I think, uh, Chris. <laughs> Uh, Friday, do you want to take yourself off? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've forgotten I'd been off the mute, on mute. Uh, <laughs> listen, Chris, uh, great case here, just like the ones you've done before, right up my street about what I do. Uh, Devon and April are a sort of age profile range where ideally they should be thinking about what next. And I think you quite rightly mentioned it in your case study as well. They're speaking the right language, they're asking the right question as well. And there's a lot of questions that I want to ask as well. Um, Devon and April are in what, I, what is known as a sandwich generation. They've got the parents to look after and their children to look after as well. And then they have their own uh, decisions to make as well moving forward. So there's a, quite a few things that I'd like to cover later, but you know, initially I'd ask is put a little bit more thoughts on the question they've actually already asked. And then we can explore from that and identify options and solutions that they can move forward with. So yeah, later on the extra question, I'd like to ask a bit more about goals and objectives. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm doing some work at the minute on a white paper in conjunction with Coventry University um, about helping people of a certain age. And I'm still trying to work out how to define politely 50 to 65 without offending anybody. I still haven't worked out how I'm going to do that yet. But there's a really good book that I want to recommend called Wellbeing by Tom Rath and Jim Harter. And it talks about the elements of somebody's life they might want to consider to have a really good overall wellbeing. It's an amazing read. So we're going to be using that in the, in the research. It's based on uh, research by Gallup. Um, really, really good. Oh, great. So, so thanks for that, Pradeep. Richard, what yeah. were your thoughts on the case study and where could you add value potentially? Yeah, cheers, Chris. Uh, a couple of areas, really. I think the first one would be from uh, Devon Miles' perspective. Um, so I would be looking at talking to him around um, you know, his mortgage property. Firstly, um, it looks like, I can't read, is it unencumbered perhaps? It says it's mortgage free. so. Nothing there at all. He seems to be the guy that likes to have paid it off over time. Traditional, typical type of a life cycle of a mortgage. But does he know uh, that what the current benefits of a lifetime mortgage might bring to this particular deal? So could he use his residential property to unlock uh, equity as, as an asset, uh, which would be tax-free? So you would have uh, the cash to put towards uh, the investment, the ready funds, that would allow him to keep pensions and investments uh, in place. I didn't necessarily have to unlock them. So I would, I would want to cover that off. Mm -hmm. And then on the second point I would look at is um, going over to April's mum um, and looking at Maureen, I think her name was. So where there are concerns around um, long-term care or being forced to go into long-term care, perhaps, um, I'd have a conversation around, um, again, perhaps converting Maureen's property uh, into uh, like an equity release deal so that we can also unlock the uh, equity there to, to pay for in, internal care. Um, it might be that we can have a conversation and she might not want to go into the care home and she may be happy to have somebody come in. It's quite a complex conversation because 
um, you know, you're effectively you're inviting um, strangers into your home. However, they will be professionals, they'll be trained to do so, and I think over time the benefits of a rapport and a relationship will, will kick in. So, so firstly, that's what you can do there. The second thing with staying with Maureen, however, is um, if she does go into a care home, we can look at potentially using the property uh, as an investment property, changing it over to uh, a buy-to-let type arrangement. So what we can look at there, um, I, don't, I said it right at the start of the call actually, we can now look at equity release mortgages on uh, a buy-to-let, one of the lenders do do that. So typically what we, can, what we see now is, um, let's say for example we've got the equity release buy-to-let buy mortgage in place, um, there will be no mortgage payments on a monthly basis, so any rent that's received will be 100% and so that could go towards the cost of any care home um, provisions. Yeah, it's an interesting one as well because having that in your locker, clearly Devon's going to have potentially an IHT issue. Um, and whereas the strategy previously might have been to use the pension first, yes. now that the rules are that there's, as long as you've assigned it, there's no IHT liability on it, you've got to be careful at 75 because there's a tax rule that kicks in at 75. The way that you'd structure that withdrawal from the estate to pay for their next stage in life might be different and might include something like equity release, right? Yeah, correct. So they don't, these days they don't have to take lump sums um, on the withdrawal. They can do it on a monthly basis or any, any kind of period really, quarterly and so on. So that would make the deal cheaper in the long run as well. Um, and it would just act like an income, I guess, if, if they wanted to do it that way. Oh, Elliot, thoughts on the case study, mate? Um, the first thing that I'd really ask was really Devon's appetite for risk, really. Obviously, he's selling his business for 1.8, which is brilliant. But then he's talking about potentially investing in a startup. He's obviously 64 years old. Does he really want to go through the hassle of a startup and potentially lose your money at 64 years old? Okay. Is it it's an interesting one. I mean, I, the way that we tackle that is what's your attitude to risk on the mm. core financial plan and making sure that people have got enough money to do that mm. and then maybe having an element of play money, but there's not enough detail in the case study, it's my fault, to, to define how much that's going to be. But that's certainly a question you'd ask, right? Yeah, definitely. And obviously following on from that, obviously he's got a rental property there as well of, of 200,000. Got what ninety thousand pound mortgage on now. I, I want to find out what's the reasons for first of all buying a property. Was it originally bought for a rental, or was it then turned into a rental? Um, what they're currently earning out of that, if they're earning, earning anything at all, it potentially could be improved. Is it on repayment, or is it on interest only? Um, and are they open to potentially investing in more property? Yeah. For additional income, and obviously, following what, what Richard said as well, just with regards to Maureen, April's mum. Yeah, potentially going down the equity release avenue there as well to pay for her ongoing care, if need be. Cool, thanks, mate. Really appreciate that. Ian, thoughts? Uh, yeah, so rather than kind of go over everything that uh, people have already done, um, certainly want to know if the decision to sell was his or whether he received advice. Um, and explore what that advice was, what other options. Um, with respect to his own company, I certainly want to ask him about changing turnover, gross profit, uh, and what the cash growth is like on the balance sheet. Uh, because I know I'm stepping over into your charity a bit, Chris, but those, those pensions don't seem particularly sizable. Um, and it, it could be that you know, they should have been putting more in on pension contributions, lowering corporation tax, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the same question with Janet about dividends. Uh, yeah, Kit's an interesting one um, because if his plan is to reduce time in, in the business, uh, then if Kit could then become the manager, um, uh, Devon and, and April can still be board members, still take... Um, an executive role, still take basic salary, but then really rely on the, the dividends for the rest of their income. Uh, 
and then question how much of his mind is made up to sell. Um, with regards to Michael and Mitch, um, I digress a little bit, but I've seen quite a bit at the moment uh, out and about about uh, Brewdog being the biggest opportunity that Dragons then turned down. And is this how he sees this opportunity? He's obviously got um, technology uh, in uh, vehicle manufacture. So uh, is that why he's looking at this? However, if he's going to be investing, my question is why only an advisory role? Uh, for me, investing a reasonable sum of money would mean full directorship, share agreements, etc. Um, so yeah, Paul, you might get a call on that. Um, and then same as everybody else, uh, the other assets, how else can they use them if he is going to sell um, rather than taking large risks, taking up Elliot's point about risk appetite, expanding property portfolio will, will give um, more, more income uh, and changing the purpose of, of the existing company if they're going for an asset sale will then enable that, that transition quite easily. Yeah, I mean, one, one point there that sort of I'd like to cover off is whilst they're still directors of the business, we'd certainly recommend that, that potentially, and particularly with a client like this, they maximise their pension contributions. Now, why, why is it important that they're still directors of the business? Number one, because the, what they can do is treat it as an employer contribution and pay whatever they haven't paid in the last three years plus the current year in as a lump sum. Um, and if they, if they do that as an individual, they're capped to their 100% of their earnings. But if they do it as an employer contribution plan, then they're not. Um, and certainly if, if, they're, if their route is potential tax mitigation and shelter from a IHT issue, we'd want to consider that as, as, as one option. So thanks for raising that, Ian. That's, I think that's important to do. Toby. Sorry, oh, did, was you saying if they do it as an employer contribution, there's, there's no cap? There is a cap, mate. The cap, right. the cap is the annual allowance, right. um, which is 40k at the minute, yep. plus the previous three years um, uh, of unused contributions. Right. No, makes sense. Um, so, so the the reality is, you could you could probably look it up to one sixty each. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But only if they haven't made any additional contributions in that period yeah. of time. So yeah, if they if they've made thirty grand over the past three or four years, you just take that off of the one sixty. So if um, there's so if there's significant um, if there's cash. significant cash in do the contributions for them each um possibly if they've got no other income you could vote dividends to take them up to the basic rate band and i haven't done the exact maths but as long as if that takes uh, certainly uh, devon clo he's 80 percent closer or a lot closer to that one million threshold for er relief then that that might be a strategy yeah and 100 percent. i mean if you can if you can potentially get corporation tax relief on 300 odd grand yeah. plus you you'd, you'd probably want that plus take that 300 out, grand out of the um iht calculation immediately um now you've got to be careful because because at 75 there's a crystallization event that might mean that tax comes into play again but as a as an immediate way to reduce inheritance tax that pension contribution is an absolute no-brainer yeah that makes sense yeah. Toby, thoughts? Um, yeah, I don't want to repeat a lot of what's been said, but I had similar notes. Um, you know, what are they still negotiating over? Um, if a figure's been settled before it's been decided on asset sale or share sale, um, giving that feedback. Just heard some background noise there, sorry. Um, uh, also, um, something that extrapolating from something. Was he looking, uh, see I'm interested in the mindset, the intangibles here. Um, was he looking to sell or was he approached for the sale? Because uh, that's, that's quite important to me. Um, and where did the figure come from? You know, have, has he got a Mike Ainsworth involved? You know, uh, has anybody actually you know, valued the, the business? Where's that figure come from? 
Um, what else have I got? Yeah, and again, I'd, I'd want to have a, a deep dive with Devon, um, you know, particularly into the he wants and what he wants for his semi-retirement. You know, what does he want to travel, family, lifestyle, um, and then just work out what his lifestyle is going to cost uh, yeah. before we can get into has he got enough money. And, and other things, I, I was surprised that it was just he was only looking at an advisory role um, for um, Michael and Mitch's business. Um, other things I'd like to know, um, is he intending to retain a directorship in um, the existing business or a consultancy role? Um, what's, I'd like to know a bit more about the, the other business, the, uh, the buoyancy you know, um, What's the patent situation with that? What, What's their backgrounds, Michael and Mitch's backgrounds? What's their vision for their business? What's uh, Devon's vision for his role within the business? Um, these are all the sorts of things that I'd like to know. Also, how much money have these guys put in? Yeah, it's uh, a good question. Know, you know, um, is it 50-50? Um, has one put in more than another? And basically how much? And you know, is it director's loans? You know, what's, what's the structure of that? Um, yeah. Yeah, That's really good. Opinion. Really, really good. Okay, that's fine. I suppose one point on that, and the conversation I'm having with a, a lot of my new clients at the minute, is getting to the bottom of an honest number about how much income they need yeah. um, for the remainder of their life. Because uh, when, 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 like the new clients that we've taken on, um, we've tended to go through a bit of a journey where it's right. Okay, how much? How much do you need for the rest of your life? And they go, well, my bills are x i was like right okay let's have two numbers let's have a survive figure and let's have a thrive figure yeah and, and what i'm more interested in whether we could achieve as opposed to you just paying your bills every month yeah. um because uh, a last third of your life just paying your bills doesn't sound <laughs> doesn't sound particularly fun no. um um and on that on that note um there is a as you'd expect from one of these in the circles, and I've, I've got in the habit of doing it now, there is a really dodgy 80s reference in the, hidden in the case study. Um, John, what were your, uh, any additional thoughts about questions you'd ask? Uh, yes, yes. So um, it says that Miles is, uh, one option Miles is considering is investing in uh, his friend's Michael's business. Right, okay, so how much? Are you looking at putting in? Yeah. Right, I'm just sorry. I'm just reading that again. It says one option. Miles is considering. Is that meant to say Devon? Devon. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Okay. Person. Then. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's around around sort of the uh, the small enterprise in, or the seed enterprise investment scheme, not small, and the enterprise investment scheme is that the um, the seed enterprise investment scheme is a lot it's a lot more tax efficient okay so you can get a 50 percent income tax reducer rather than a 30 percent so you're, you're always going to go to that first if you meet the criteria the cap's um, 150k on that one isn't it i, I, remember 100, I, must, I thought it was 100 oh, you might be right, actually. 150 i think oh it is 150 right okay uh, no, I think so, it's 100 I thought it was a hundred. Yeah, it is hundred. I thought it was a hundred. Okay, um, yeah, it is right. Sorry. So, so you'd look at you'd look at that, okay? And the other, and one of the other, I think, is that when you invest in a in a qualifying business for that, you can't own more than twenty nine percent of the business. Okay, so we're going to want to know how much he's investing, all right, and at what the what percentage of the business he's getting for that amount as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Can you can you be a director of a? Somebody mentioned about the restrictions in terms of directorship. Yeah. Can you not? Can you can you be a director of a well, SEI as you invest in? Yeah, I didn't think you could if you was going to uh, take advantage of them schemes. I don't think you no. could be um, within the management team of that. Yeah, I mean, one of the other. Th in the case studies, we don't even know whether the company qualifies for being an SI, SEIS no. firm, do we yet? So, so it might, it, it might be academic. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Fact that it, the fact that it's, uh, I did look at that, and the fact that it says Michael is opening a business, 
suggest that it does qualify, but it does, from my understanding, it does have to stay within certain parameters uh, for, for a certain amount of time, even after the investment. Mm. Okay, cool. Jack Lynn, thoughts on the case study? Okay, um, for me, questions I'd want to ask Devon, um, I think it's like, besides his business history and success, what does he actually want his legacy to be? So that can be his le business legacy and his personal stroke life legacy. Yeah. Um, so the business legacy, um, you know, it's, it's talking about the, what someone's left with after interacting with your business and the inheritance after you've gone. So for instance, like uh, the product and its reputation. On his personal legacy, looking at the difference his presence and leadership has made to his family and the money and property, etc., that he'll leave behind. Uh, what would he get from working with Michael and Mitch in an advisory capacity? And that's in his intellectual life, his emotional, spiritual, and financial life. But that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Like when I look, look at legacy, it's not only about the money, it's about what you want to be remembered for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people, when they go through this thought process, underestimate that element, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very important because it's a, it's a foundational thing that they're on. Um, and I'd want to know what is April's opinion on this potential new direction of being an advisor and investor. <laughs> It'd be a big it's mistake not, for him not to talk to his wife about it. Uh, you know what? I, I know, I know, I know this is weird, but I've just got Cassie in my head now going, <laughs> are you not taking another thing on, Chris? Are you? Oh, come on, leave it. So you're right. In terms of that family input, it's important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then looking at um, Eminem, Michael and Mitch, I'd like, he, he's, he's a friend with one, but he doesn't really, I don't think he knows the other. So really, what's their story? What is their story? What's been their journey? Mm. Um, what are their values and motivations, and do they match with his? Um, okay. Where does their capital? Where does their capital come from? And they're spending for on what? Um, I'd like to, so. The bottom line at the moment is that I see their business as a money pit for him and he could become their business sugar daddy advising and investing so does he really want to do that he could end up running the business for them if he's not yeah. careful yeah. Yeah, he sounds like a d person from belbin's um team roles so he could be he could be the driver rather than them being the drivers whether he wants the commitment of that as well right mm -hmm. who knows yeah mitch, mitch might have had a background in uh, life saving might have been. Might have. <laughs> in, in, a, in a bay somewhere. I'd yeah. hope so. I'd hope so. Hopefully in a pair of really bright shots. Yeah. Um, San, Sandra, what did you think of the case study and just share uh, with you? Well, most of the uh, queries I had, uh, they, they've already been raised, but uh, there are a few things maybe I can mention. Uh, for example, his uh, Devon's health condition, because that might be relevant okay. uh, yeah. for IHT purpose. Uh, also, you know, the, the business, has that been grown organically or that's been uh, bought from, from another business because that will affect the, the value of the capital gains. Uh, another question might be, you know, the rental pr property that they have. Uh, uh, did they ever live in that property uh, in, the, in the past? Uh, before they move into their, their other other uh, uh, property. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, these are a few. Uh, well, uh, already uh, the dividend query I had, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been raised for me, so why didn't they take a dividend? And because they're taking minimum salary, uh, yeah. they, can, they can take some more dividends and uh, uh, yeah, uh, get some more, uh, some more cash for themselves. Uh, yeah, apart from that, uh, yeah, there's nothing much at the moment, uh, I think, uh, to raise from my side. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Kevin, thoughts? Can you unmute yourself, Mike? 
Sorry, as I was like a rival, I think Richard's covered everything I would have said anyway. So uh, I'll keep quiet. It was an interesting case study as normal. Uh, thank you. Paul, Not a rival, you... we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're all collaborators here. We're, we're all friends here. So it's a team game. It's a team game. Um, Paul, what were your thoughts, mate? Uh, mine is obviously mostly from the perspective of how wheels. Uh, well, but the board wheels that they are obviously seeking instructions on. So it would be potentially, they have one at the moment that is quite straightforward, uh, left it to themselves and their son. I mean, in addition to the various tax savings that has been discussed, potentially would say, um, ensure the business is one that can well, potentially attract business property relief as far as inheritance tax is concerned. Um, potentially, um, you know, whatever surplus funds they have, currently what, 64 and 65, I think it's probably a good age to take uh, advantage of the uh, potentially exam transfers. So they could transfer, uh, yeah, a decent amount to their son. And even if not, they still have the option of the spas on themselves. So the other point would be the pensions obviously set up to ensure that it's, it is, um, it is um, applied outside inheritance uh, uh, tax, if you like, so that it's named and payable directly under the trust to, to a named beneficiary right. as opposed to coming into the estate and um, well in the initial instance it doesn't matter because it's exempt between the couple but it's usually where the second spouse is passing on where you know the hefty inheritance uh, inheritance tax bill uh, comes into play but even then I wouldn't worry too much because we can always explore uh, deeds of variation at uh, later stages in future and the that's what the time is that, yes, that's that's correct. Very so um, would also say to the um, parties to have lasting powers of attorney obviously put in place um, would sound like uh, sorry, property and financial affairs and or include the health and welfare um, aspect as well to ensure that at least whatever happens they have someone to step in as an attorney to deal with uh, the affairs for them. I would then say, for instance, the as far as the mom situation is concerned, how is the property uh, property currently held? If if it's tenancy in common, then obviously they've probably already ring fence up to fifty percent because she's concerned about having to pay for care fees. It sounds like at eighty two though that it's probably late in the day to <laughs> to try to say save the day, but you never know. I would say she could potentially, again, um, dilute her interest in the property or actually transfer to the son and pay him a rent. Hopefully that's cheaper than <laughs> paying for care fees. But I think generally I would say, look, just live your life as best as you can. If your property has to be sold, it's sold. You pay your care fees from the proceeds of the sale your children sounds like the daughter is well off financially. It shouldn't be a deal breaker if they have to pay pay for, for care fees. Uh, the other point I've looked at would be, yeah, potential gifts to charities from, from the wills to reduce the tax liabilities even more. And um, I think those are let's yeah. see what other points I have, yeah. Yeah, really good points there, Paul. I think um, giving the money away now is sensible, right? You know, like, so do we look at potentially exempt transfers to Absolutely. start that seven-year clock? And then the other thing is as well, when we, we wouldn't base somebody's core financial plan on investments like this, but if you hold a portfolio of AIM shares, it qualifies for business property relief. So slightly more volatile than... yeah. Uh, a, a, a broader market, 
but but certainly there's there's investments that only buy a qualify name shares and they they sit outside of the estate after two years because because you get the business property relief on them so that's a really good way of doing it really interesting debate about whether it's too late to plan for mum right because at 82 you'd assume that potentially it might be but you some of you might have seen this before and apologies if i just share my screen very quickly what what i'm going to do can you can you guys see that yep yeah so so um this is one of my favorite free online tools available on the office of national statistics and it talks about how long at your age to today on average you'd be expected to live um, based on real data and somebody who was female at the age of 82 today would be expected to live until 91. so it's a risk but potentially there's an argument to say that you've got some planning scope there to make some decisions and it, it's you know an expectation that you haven't got that seven years to plan for actually you might have um so it might inform the conversation a bit by using the real life statistics to do that um so hopefully that's useful charlie thoughts thoughts on the case study mate chris can i just ask one question yeah um I thought there was a lot of, lot of pressure uh, a little while ago about forcing people to sell their property within their lifetime to pay for care. Did, did there, uh, sorry, did anything actually come of that? Was there any law change or is that still the case? So I think my understanding of the rules is that it depends on the local authority. So it's local authorities that make the decision in terms and again paul might be able to uh, give me some input in terms of this um but if you've got no other assets most local authorities consider property as an asset you can sell for to cover care costs paul yeah i mean they would generally not force obviously not force the sale they would you know if they have to register a charge on on the property um you know and or where they where they have a, a attorneys uh see what attorneys can come up with to raise the funds i mean a few of them would go the equity release uh route or just try to get family members to pay you know in the interim but yeah they would generally try not to obviously force the sale to avoid bad press but other than that uh, yeah they they would try to work with the family members to to see how best to pay for care you, you can even get a situation where local authorities, if they believe that a property has been passed to the children to avoid paying for care home costs, they can actually require... Um, the yeah, deliberate, deliberate deprivation. That's yeah, right. yeah. Because yeah. I've, I've looked into this because we moved my uh, mother and father-in-law in, um, into the annex next to us. And there's all sorts of things. There's you know, issues with, um, uh, was it gifts without reservation of benefit you have to be careful of um it's it's quite a minefield uh, yeah i mean you do some work on that ourselves i think there's two elements like a lot of people muddy the waters between iht and care yeah so gift with reservation is an iht an issue IHT, yeah. care is about that have you sold it to to effectively the take voice. that out of the estate of the individual but yeah no it's uh yeah, I, think, I think the bigger problem you've got is having your mother and father-in-law so close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, especially, I wouldn't do, would do it for my mum and dad. <laughs> especially during lockdown. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, it's been a benefit because otherwise we would have been having to be down. Yeah, they lived, used to live 20 minutes away. Now it's like a, a, a five yeah. So it's, it's actually yeah. made it easier because we care for them as well. Yeah. 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 I think that's another point about the, the issue of the age as well. So if you try to, you know, I don't know, transfer, if you try to, uh, I don't know, maybe set up certain facilities to reduce uh, mom's share of the property, potentially it would be caught under those provisions as deliberate yeah. uh, privation. Yeah, so yeah. at 82, say, right, when you did effect these transfers, you know, what's, what's the likelihood that you were looking at going into care in, I don't know, four, five, six years, and you know effective yeah. the changes to the title 
just to you know just to I don't know mitigate your situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, what we don't know because it's not the case study is what other assets she's got. So there might be an IHT planning conversation to be had that's separate from the care one. But but yeah, we'd have, we'd have to understand a bit more about the case to do that. Charlie, what were your thoughts, mate? Well, as I said, Chris, I think you've given me quite a, uh, a tough one here. <laughs> I mean, I think for, for Michael and Mitch's business, um, if they get these contracts, that might lead to them bringing in employees. Um, and I think it's, it's always wise, probably before the first employee arrives, to think about what they want these employees to look like um, and, you know, and, and how perhaps they want to reward them for the work they're doing. Um, although, uh, you know, they say that directors are employed and in theory they, that does cover them into the auto-enrollment uh, legislation, as directors it's probably likely neither of them would need to enrol into, into a pension scheme, so they wouldn't necessarily actually have to have something set up. Um, but that might be of their benefit depending on what their pension uh, aspirations are. Uh, because sometimes getting a, a corporate pension can be cheaper than than what you'd get on the market. But it, it very much depends on what their aspirations are. They could actually take out um, life insurance, group life insurance and group income protection uh, with two employees. But there would be an expectation from the insurance providers that at some point in the near future, they would be taking on more employees than that. And ideally for, for group policies, you really want to start with five people. Um, but it is possible to get them for two or more. Um, I'd actually probably be more interested in, in asking Devon if he could uh, introduce me to the business or, or the people that are acquiring his firm, um, because what we would do for them is an audit of the current benefits and, and pension that are in place, um, principally just looking for some areas where mistakes might have been made, particularly on the automatic enrolment, um, just to check that you know what they're purchasing isn't coming with a load of liabilities they haven't foreseen. Um, in my experience, I've seen businesses where they've incorrectly applied tax relief, um, and and also they've incorrectly or, or you know generally failed to enrol employees into their pension scheme as well. So um, you know I've worked for. Uh, people that have bought businesses that have discovered these things later on and I would suggest that the best time to find out whether or not a business has these liabilities is it's before, before, you, buy you, it. It. Yeah, before <laughs> you buy it well, before you buy it I mean obviously from Devon's point of view he might just hope that this all goes away but you know again in the situations I've been involved I have seen the, the purchases of the business come back after the seller um, you know to, to, to sort of say you've left us with a huge liability well, that, that comes back, I, and again, I, I don't know how this would be computed when it comes to evaluation, but Mike can potentially help us with this. You've got a value of a business. There's a potential risk and liability with buying that business. And if, if, if you take a professional services business as an example, there may be a risk of complaint or a risk of... Um, you know, you'd want to do enough due diligence to make sure that business was clean. What impact potentially might that future risk have on the valuation? Well, the, 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 the seller's going to give warranties and guarantees in the first place. So you kind of assume that anything that isn't disclosed that comes out afterwards would be covered by them. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've never, I don't, I've never incorporated that into evaluation, I must say. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And we Mike, would those warranties and guarantees be personal? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and how long does that liability last typically? Dep it, well, it depends what the guarantee says. It depends what, it depends what the, the documents say. Uh, yeah. Again, I would suggest that's going to be negotiable in some places and not fairly open ended in others. But, uh, okay. Fair enough. Okay. Kevin, in terms of this case study, what would you be thinking about recommending, mate? Hi, uh, Let's be honest, in the first part, we can't really help in the main part. It's all around the mother and that situation uh, where you've got to consider it. And for care future is very good. The existing situation of a mortgage uh, to defend it against local authority in the nicest of ways uh, for the family and gifting is a very good option, even at 82, slightly late. But it's still a very strong option rather than the local authority taking out the fees costs. 
and obviously you would have to cover uh, domiciliary care in their own home first rather than running into a long term care home as it's a very long line of care. So you've got flexibility there, but that's the main area around the mother would be needed to be more investigated. Okay, cool. Sanjo, just a quick question for you. Um, structure of sale, how would you potentially advise them on how um, Devon should look at making sure that he was structuring the sale in the best way possible? Well, uh, I think already Mike mentioned that the for from uh, seller's point of view, it's the, the share sale is uh, his best option rather than asset. Uh, so yeah, I mean uh, that that would be well. Well, my recommend as well that that same thing. I mean, uh, sell the shares, uh, which will uh, give him. Uh, I mean, tax tax wise, better efficiency. However, mm -hmm. there is a there is a recent development uh, for entrepreneurs really because it doesn't exist anymore uh, from uh, this this April that uh, that change to business asset disposal relief. Uh, now, one uh, change, uh, most of them are same, uh, but one change is that uh, the lifetime allowance. Uh, uh, that used to be 10 million before now. It it's, uh, it's now it's 1 million. Uh, so, the 800,000 won't be qualified for, for this 10% uh, uh, tax relief. Uh, so, that might make him think about whether uh, that should be a share purchase or uh, asset purchase. I mean, the maths needs to be done, which which uh, would be better option for him. Okay, okay, and 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 but potentially some of that could be mitigated by investing that in the new yeah, business. Yeah, so in or... EIS, in EIS, or yeah, yeah. EIS, CIS, or VCT. Uh, yeah. But obviously, the, those are not reliable shares. So there, there are lots of benefits, uh, but on the other hand. Uh, Particularly because the new business hasn't got a commercial contract yet. I mean, yes. that might be a bit of a worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Jacqueline, how what process would you follow to help Devon work out what might be next? Oh, can you unmute? Yeah, he needs um, action plan. Okay. So he needs to get April's input so that he knows where she stands with things. Um, discuss with Michael and Mitch their vision and their motivations. Uh, and think about the product innovation. Uh, they seem to have one product. They've gone to three different types of market and then I don't think they're too sure where they're going really. So yeah, he needs yeah. to, they, need, he, they need to understand that. He needs to understand it as well. Um, so then they need to define what they mean by advisory because he could find himself being put into a tiny call and possibly invested a lot of money. Um, so he's got to weigh those things up. Um, for them, they need to look at their strengths and do a role analysis because um, it's not clear who, what do they have or who does what, but it doesn't seem, for me, it didn't seem quite right how they divided up their, their roles. Um, yeah, do they have a partnership agreement in place? It sounds like there may be people who have become excited by the product that they have designed. They've had initial interests, but what have they done about the feedback they may have received about their product? So they need to be, think about that. Um, I think what they really need from Devon is his business insight, his wisdom, expertise. Um, and possibly contacts might be more important. Yeah. And I'd want them to think about Devon and Michael's friendship. Can it withstand and survive the business journey? That's fair. So those are um, things I'd want to, action plans I'd want them to have. And are they prepared to put that pressure on? Right? Yeah. Don't know. Mm -hmm. Toby, would you, what would you do? I mean, would you get the three guys in a room and just map this out? How would you, with that, getting that, making sure that dynamic was right if Devon was going to get involved in Mitch and Michael's business? Absolutely. I, th I, I think getting them in a room is a good idea because 
you can you can read between three people much better than if you sit down with one and sit down with the two together you know separately yeah um, you'll be able to see how that dynamic is you'll be able to see how um how they gel together and and it comes back to that vision have they got that that joint vision together are they you know are they enthusiastic together or is there something holding back and you know are they and much better face to face than on zoom <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's do this after lockdown. Um, you know, uh, you can just tell by you know, micro expressions, just little things that um, you know how people are really feeling about it. You know, yeah. uh, it's so important to get that. Is it, it, it's funny, isn't it? Like, sort of, Ian and I was having a conversation earlier on. One of our twelve million conversations today Ian, about about how easier business is when you're enthusiastic about your future Absolutely. you know Absolutely. like that that sort of jaded business owner who's got mm. to the stage where they're going i'm really not enjoying this anymore and i suppose part of that is reigniting that for some people isn't it yeah. john just in, ter in terms of in, from a, is that your dog <laughs> is it always your dog Oh, he's, he's, oh, right, he's going to go and get the dog. Um, uh, Ian, did you have any thoughts about making sure that the new combination works? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Jacqueline, and I, I appreciate the comment about having all three of them in the room together. I would actually speak to them separately first, mm -hmm. then bring them together and let each of all, all of them know together what each of them thinks and, and see that the light suddenly turn on. Um, as they discover what everyone really thinks about, you know, how this new venture could move forward. Um, it, it, I think that would be a really interesting dynamic. Risky, potentially. It, it's got, it's, it's got to be honest, though. Unless they go yeah. into this being honest, then, it, it, you know, it's going to fall foul further down the line. Yeah, no, no, fair, fair comment. Apparently, for once, John, that wasn't your dog. It was Mike's dog. Um, <laughs> Mine did go off at the same time. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm more than happily let him take the rap. Yeah, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon man, I think. Yeah, um, and and in terms of in terms of John, what input would you have in terms of whether um, uh, Mitch should have a share? Where would you would you set up different chair classes? What would you advise in terms of like the the technical setup of him having a share in the business potentially? Um, it's really going to depend on the it's really going to depend on the arrangement. To be honest with you, um, a lot of the time, um, certainly look with the businesses I work with, anyone who's got different sort of share classes it kind of indicates that they're only being set up for tax reasons, to be honest with you. Um, and I haven't, I haven't really, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen an inquiry on it before, so I don't know if, if it works or not. Maybe, um, maybe the other gentleman in here can, might be able to comment on that. Um, but I, I suppose you'd be sitting there as an investor, you go normally it's the case you put your money in and you're like, well, I want X amount of percent of that. And you know, um, and then you discuss your d discuss your dividends at, at year end. Really, um, is there not was, a, is, is there not a sort of if they had the same share class, a sort of an obligation to offer equal dividends at the end of the year? Absolutely, but that's generally how our business runs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, how, that's how our proper business runs. I mean, unless unless they were sitting there and like, I suppose it's one of them whereby if uh, Mitch. Michael and Devon have got completely different personal scenarios, which obviously, look, by the sounds of it, they, they, they have to invest. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, Devon's at a completely different stage of his I life. Um, what tends to happen is with the separate share classes is that, is that one person might not want, might not want his dividend, might not want dividends voted to him. I don't know. It could be a variety of reasons. Maybe he's heading towards high rate tax. Maybe, um, Maybe he's um, maybe two of the is it my yeah Michael or Mitch they might not want to have to pay child benefit back if they're earning less than less than fifty k a year or they're close to it um, they might be trying to avoid paying CSA to a disgruntled ex wife 
and they might just want to keep their, it can be literally, or, or one of them might be looking to get a, a huge mortgage. Um, they tend to be the reasons why, why you'd set up separate share classes, but it ends up, I mean, quite frankly, it just ends up getting too complicated a lot Mess. of the time. I really, really, I don't think I've got any clients with it. I really try and avoid it if I can. Yeah. Because uh, you just end up with two people with, you know, two people, completely different objectives. And, and yeah, so it just, just makes the whole thing a, a bit of a pain, to be honest yeah. with you. And, and tough to get the equality on it, right? You know, like, it, it, it sort of, if you've got one person saying, I've got this this year, but I'm not going to take that this year, then you've just tried, you've got to try and manage that in future years. And how do you, how do, you do that? Absolutely. Um, so can, I, can I just add uh, in terms of this alphabet share? Now, one good thing about this alphabet share is that they can get paid according to, you know, uh, they, they can come to an agreement that uh, I, I will work for this hour uh, a day and I will get paid for in, uh, rather than paying uh, as a salary, I, I would take it as a dividend. So in that uh, circumstances, this might be a uh, good planning to, to have uh, different types of shares. And no, those sorts of agreements they they work do they yeah yeah okay cool yeah, yeah. sorry oh, sandra that, that was a contract that paid people in dividends uh, no, over. There, there won't be any contract uh, well yeah there, there might be a contract or something but uh, you know uh, if if they uh, if some of them work you know uh, maybe four days a week another person work one day a week so obviously someone who is uh, working more he should uh, he should get paid more, and uh, rather than paying him a salary, they can they can pay him a pay him a share. Uh, okay, sorry, that's new one. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a new one to me because my assumption was that that would have to be remunerated by a salary, not oh, dividend. Whilst people do it, I suppose, yeah, I thought it might be under like disguised remuneration, if you like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I don't know. As I said, I haven't, I haven't come. I mean, I there is no, to... there is no. Uh, I mean, from from a legal point of view, there is no restriction to do that. I mean, people okay. can get paid by salary, or they they can get paid by by dividends. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so I, I don't think there is. I mean, as far as I know, there is no legal restriction to do that. Okay. Uh, Elliot, um, in ter in terms of care, if he was looking to buy a property, what um what we're looking at in terms of like maybe um. Devon might want to give him some money to, to get on the property ladder. What sort of percentage would he need to be looking at and how do we make sure that that's done as efficiently as possible? Yeah, if he's looking to purchase a residential, then obviously the current climax, he's going to need at least a 10% deposit and he, uh, lenders will take a, a gift to be in his main, being his sole deposit. So that's no problem at all. And then it's just a gift as deposit that's going to be completed, which, which is fine. If you're looking to, to let, then again, um, you're looking probably a 25% deposit, 20% deposit for the buyer's let, so you're definitely looking at a sort of 75% loan to value, a 25% deposit, uh, the, the, and the more it opens you up to better rates. Cool, thanks for that. Friday. Uh, I do, yes. Um, what I was looking at, considering um, uh, Mick, uh, Mitch, Michael, and uh, Devon's relationship in the business, um, I'd like to know Devon's idea of what he's going in there for. There's a 20-year age gap between these guys. Uh, Devon has obviously got a lot of maturity and... Oh. Oh. Pradeep, are you there? Uh, we've lost. I think we lost. We lost Bradley for that one. I was just. I was just getting into. I was, I was interested in what's, Oh, he's back. He's back. Right, go on. Sorry, Bradley. Assume that we didn't hear that, mate. Can we? Sorry, can we? Can we, can we please? Can we please go back to just seeing people in real life? Can we just do that at some point in the future? <laughs> it was so much easier. Go on, Bradley. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, what I'm looking at is um, Devon's reason why he wants to get involved with his young startup business. Um, two re two uh, things to look at here, consider it, is one thing that he's accumulated a wealth of uh, experience and wisdom running his own business. So he could be a perfect mentor for these two young lads. Uh, and he could be a guide for them as well to make a success of the business. Now, that's, it also depends on how much time he wants to spend on it, because on the case study, he does out a 
work-life balance. So there's a crucial question there, how much time would he want to spend on that? Also release the time for his other activities that he wants to pursue in his life. Um, there's a lot of things here actually, because you know we are shifting uh, uh, colossally um, in, uh, you know, when you talk about how old were our parents were when they retired and our grandparents. Uh, Chris, you mentioned about the white paper from Coventry University about the extended life. Is about life planning ahead. You've got another 20 years, possibly 30 years ahead of us. And you know, you've already lived that kind of life. So what do you do ahead? If you're in reasonably good health, now is the time to take responsibility for it. Because when you were active in your business, you were mentally functioning, physically running around your business. So that kept you in reasonably good health. When you're not full-time engaged in that responsibility, what are you gonna to do to maintain your health? The other part of it is your uh, uh, social interaction, your relationship. When you're in your business, you're interacting with your clients, your suppliers, your employees. So it keeps you in that uh, social interaction mode. When you step out of your business, it's going to have a huge void in your life. And you need to replace it with something. So again, it needs thinking through. A couple of things that I really like to go through, and it's something that I love helping figure it out, is... Um, there's a lot of fallacy about retirement or later life. You know, it looks glitzy that, you know, I can put up my shoes, boots or stilettos and not do anything. Uh, but the, when the reality dawns, life is different. And unless you have thought it through what you want to do ahead, then you are at least prepared for when the time comes, when the decisions have to be made. We also think about what was fulfilling in your life things that you did kept you getting the buzz, you know, day-to-day -day activity, firefighting, business decisions. You won't have that anymore. So what's going to spark your light when you're moving forward? You need something that is tangible, that gets you to jump out of your bed in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to have a full day today. And then at the end of the day, you think that was a good one. Otherwise, what happens is you've got family there. You've got your mother-in-law there for Devon uh, in April. And they will call on his demand for his time. So they'll say, well, you haven't got much to do now, Devon. So can you do X, Y, and Z? And with all good intention and good heart, you could fall into doing things for other people. And I'm not saying being selfish, but balancing out with your own purpose in life and also fulfilling your obligation that you still have here. That's why that's why this book's really interesting, Pradeep. And if you want to borrow it, I'm happy to send oh, it over definitely. to you, mate. Because um, it talks about... I'd love to have a look at it, yes. Yeah, but cool. A couple of other things is, 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 you know, we talk about business planning, but when it comes to uh, our own personal planning, that tends to be put away side. You know, you do retirement planning, which is from a financial perspective. Mine is in parallel to do life planning, later life planning. And that's so key as well, because you've got milestones to reach. And also you've got this uh, perennial aging process you know we're not going to be around here for too long running around like spring chickens you know you're going to get to a time where you just kind of start forgetting things or you know you're not going to be able to do physically things to do things of the aging process to prepare for and uh, a mother his mother-in-law is a classic example to reach such a prime age and then you start seeing the health fading you have to start thinking about what what that age so you start planning ahead. So, you know, financially, we all think about it's important and it is important to have a financial cushion moving forward to maintain your lifestyle. But then if you haven't planned it, then things are going to start fall by the wayside. And no matter how much finances you have, if you haven't got the satisfaction of living on, living on a day-to-day -day basis, then you're going to be struggling. And that book will come in handy about questioning your well-being. How yeah. well are you looking after yourself? So the financial is only one small element of that. You yes, know that, yes. that it's it, it's about the it's about the overall well being. Janet, were there any additional? I'm going to start wrapping up pretty soon. Were there any additional thoughts on the case study? What else you'd recommend? What elements? Look, guys, very quickly, I've got to go. All right, but I'll uh, see you later. See you later, everyone. Love Cheers, John. Bye, Thanks, guys. mate. Bye. 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 Speak, Bye. speak you later. Yeah, I think I'd probably just like to um, look at why they're still paying off a mortgage on a property. If they're paying 1.8% on it, it seemed a bit weird if their savings can't possibly be getting that amount at the moment. So, yeah, that would be my sort of um, question on that or to, to, to address that. Um, yeah. 
it's just sort of like I think the things that we've covered, you know, obviously there's the new weight band on um, on the property when we look at the inheritance tax, sort of doing a bit of a calculation on where they sit with that then and see what recommendations on that. But, um, you know, I really like the idea of the uh, making the big pension contributions to bring down that, the value in, in the company. Yeah. It's a double whammy, isn't it? So it would yeah. To do that. So, yeah. I mean, and the other thing is as well from the from the estate planning perspective is mm -hmm. making sure. I, I don't think the lawyers with it. I don't think Broad's with us, but making sure. Oh, it's coming in now. Making sure that the uh, wills confirm that the kit is a is is in receipt of the property. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. To make yeah. sure they get that extra bit of relief. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that was sort of my other thing with the son to sort of see what he's um why well, he wasn't involved in, in business at all, what he actually does to see whether or not there was some potential there. Um but yeah, um, probably covered most of all this other sort of stuff. Well, it's, it's a weird, it's, it's a bit of a strange one, isn't it, with, when it comes to family businesses, because it yeah. just changes the dynamic a bit. I mean, yeah. Jacqueline sort of when you're looking at the family businesses do you find that like there's some people where you go you definitely shouldn't be working together yeah yeah because it, i mean it can be in any team the addition of one person changes the dynamic yeah. totally um because you've got these different relationships going on while they're doing business together but you've got also got the different relationships going on when they're in family time um just because somebody is family doesn't mean that they'll be a right fit for your business so it's important yeah. to really think about what what does that person bring to the business and then as a family is is there another is, is does that person have a different purpose in their life that you could help them to achieve but not be in the business yeah being in the business is not being in a family business is not for everybody and it shouldn't be a that just because they are family, that they'll be brilliant because sometimes they will come in with um, attitudes that actually don't fit the business values. And yeah. there's a lot of learning around uh, to do around that. Yeah, so personal relationship seeing. also matters uh, between them, how, yeah. how they are trusting each other. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's best not to assume, but my, um, I think it's something my mum used to say to me, that my granddaddy said business and friendship don't mix they can mix but you have to be careful about how you bring them together how you blend them yeah i think that's fair fair coming um as, as i say it goes back to that that old adage you look at the roles that you want to fill and fill them with the best people that's available you don't look at who's in your family and mm -hmm. try and give them a job that, that some, they might be able to do but some people do in some businesses in some some cultures it's we will look for a place for you to fit in or put you in a place but that doesn't mean that you really fit absolutely but it's just about looking after family when you're doing business it's got to be more than looking after family it's the business is an entity business has its characteristics so you must be able to look after the business because yeah, yeah. it's a business that's going to look after the family at the end of the day yeah Richard, were there any additional thoughts on the case study for you, mate? Yes, uh, just a couple of thoughtful questions, really. Uh, bringing back the power of attorney, a bit of a uh, an information giver here. Some of the, the lenders won't allow uh, a drawdown in the future if you don't have capacity. So setting up a power of attorney would be crucial there. And the other one was um, just coming back to Devon Miles and his property. I think we spoke about this before, actually, Chris, and it's a, a bit of a side effect, but if you can release uh, some equity from your residential property at uh, quite a reasonable rate, some people have taken that and put it into investment for a return, so it doesn't actually cost them anything to take the money from the residential in, in that respect. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, think, I think the challenge that I'd have with that is the risk level you'd take on any particular investment and whether you'd whether you're comfortable with taking on debt to invest. I don't know if I'd recommend that lightly, um, but certainly something that, that, that's worth considering. Elliot, any additional thoughts, mate? 
only really around um, kit really just trying to get him maybe more involved in 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 the future plans really with the uh, proposed bids maybe or or starting something with, with his dad mm. Deva maybe you know yeah yeah it's a, it's a weird one though like because charlotte's already said to me not interested i'm gonna like sort of do my own path how do you uh, I, I, I suppose and again this isn't a an inner circle question this is just a personal question <laughs> how do you make sure that you navigate your kids like you want i want to make sure charlotte lives her own life you know i want to make sure yeah. she's in a position where she's not governed to go down a particular path because her dad says so mm -hmm. so how do you how do you navigate that <laughs> kevin <laughs> It's called negotiation, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get home to have 25 and 20 on you too, and you'll find totally different. Yeah, yeah. It's and good. Yeah, it's patient. You wait till partners come along, mate. You make it more fun. <laughs> don't, don't scare me, Kevin. Don't scare me. Hey, uh, hey, um, one, oh, sorry, thing, one, one thing I did with my, my son, he's 25 now. Um, and when I was uh, starting my training as a coach one of the things we looked at was um nancy klein's time to listen and i decided to, i decided to try it out with my son um and one day i just sat with him and said i said to him tell me everything that you want to achieve in life didn't matter what it was going to be just tell me everything and i learned from him things that i would never have learned about him had i not done that just taking that time to literally give him space to speak. He was always a child who would say, you know, I'm, I, I want to be heard, I want to be heard. So this time, this, at this particular time in his teens, I gave him that space and it gave me a lot more understanding about him and it gave him a lot more understanding about me and what my desires were for him, not by me saying anything, but just by listening to him. How comfortable was he telling you the truth? Um, I think our relationship is such that he was very comfortable. Okay. Um, I've always tried to be open with him and to give him that space to be. Yeah. And um, there's things that he did as a child where I'd be, there's some things that I was supportive of like his drumming to be a musician because I'm interested in music. Other things I wasn't interested in, um, such as football, and he could get on with that and not involve me. Um, yeah. He didn't have to have mum and dad around with him all the time for everything he did. So that gave him space to be himself. Um, and so just, being in a, just uh, giving that space where he could be open. And my attitude is um, I don't get shocked by what somebody tells me. So they can tell me anything and they can express it any way. Um, for me, that is them, that space is theirs in order to communicate what they need to communicate, put it out there in the air. And sometimes it's their own voice that comes back to them, yeah. telling them certain things. Yeah. You know what? It's interesting. I think like sometimes I said to Cassie and Charlotte yesterday, sometimes you need to say stuff out loud to just th think it through yourself you know like just vocalizing it to to, to make sure and i've just realized that your house with your husband playing instruments and your son play you you must have the noisiest house do you know what i mean just just anyway ian what Please, your... I'm out. <laughs> sorry chris if i can add something before you move on uh, this space that Jacqueline is talking about, it is so, so important, even in the age range of uh, Devon, because at that time, a stage in life, if you haven't had the opportunity to realize your visions, this is a time to actually vocalize it, because when you vocalize it, you hear yourself. You know, we talk about carrying everything up on your head and on your shoulder. This is one way of offloading it, and at that age is a time when you want to travel light. And if you leave the excess baggage from the past, this is the opportunity to do that. You know, things that have gone in the past, things that haven't worked, things that have happened, uh, you could have regrets for things you haven't done. Now's the time to reconcile it and then see how you can move afresh. So this is a landscape, that, you know, it's so important to be in that space before you jump in with the both feet. 
it's interesting. We see a lot of clients in transition and some, a lot of the time they've successful careers. They've done well financially. They've, their life from the outside looks pretty oh, decent, but they want to make it, they've got a desire to make a change. So I think that can happen at any age, can't it? Um, Ian, thoughts on the case study, final thoughts, anything else you'd want to cover off? Um, yeah, I mean, as, as far as, as Devon's concerned, um, the one thing we really touched on yet is how is his business actually doing? I mean, I mentioned about looking at the turnover, looking at profits, looking at how much cash is being um, maintained within the business year on year. It, it may be that it's, it's not doing as well as it used to and he wants a new change and he wants a new challenge. Um, so the, with, with the type of people that we've got on the call, um, it, it really is a case of picking out those people who are going to say to him, okay, what are your opportunities? Once you've got this 1.8 million, what's it going to look like after tax? How can you use that? What is it? What type of involvement do you want in any new business opportunity? This is kind of pretty, uh, realm. How, how do you want to help uh, your mum stroke mother-in-law to, uh, to ensure that she gets what, what she wants out of the rest of her life? Um, you know, all, all of that is, is here. And he's obviously got a huge bias against tax. Uh, and that will be um, a very personal set of reasoning that from a business perspective, um, may not be his best friend. So there could be some very challenging conversations about, um, you know, having a, a proof of income over uh, wanting to be tax efficient. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's a couple of interesting elements there. Um, number one, people do like to pay as little tax as possible, but sometimes their goals supersede what that if it means paying a little bit more tax for them to for them to live mm. surely the life comes before the tax you know, <laughs> you know that yeah. and it, it it's it's saying to people look I, I know you want to mitigate this stuff but would you if you do invest in this business and it does get the seis um tax relief are you going to be sleeping at night as well and is how important oh. is that do you know what yeah. i mean like sort of those Emotional yeah. questions we've brought to cover off as well. Yeah. Um, but the other, the other question nobody's asked, and I, th I think it's probably import important to cover off, is who does Miles need on his team? Do you know what I mean? Who does he need as a supportive ear to guide him in the right direction? Because it sounds like he's got a lot of challenges coming up that Absolutely. he might need a lot of professional help, help with. But well, it's really it's, interesting. This is it. This is why we grow networks um, yeah. so that we have those people around us. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Mike said right at the beginning, who, who gave him this valuation or where did he get this valuation from? Without someone like, like Mike around, it's uh, uh, what is he going to know he, he could, could have missed out on? Um, so uh, there are so many people on this call that could help Devon out. Uh, asking, uh, asking the right questions will bring the right people in at the right time. Uh, and that, that's what, as far as I'm concerned, that's what Networks is all about, is, is making someone's life be the way that they want it to be. Yeah, 100%. Um, right, who have I missed? Who have I missed? Toby, uh, final thoughts? Not much more to add, actually. Um, I think most of it's been covered. Uh, like I said, for me, it's about really getting inside his mind, his mind, um, uh, April's mind as well. Because you know, are they are they both in agreement with this? You know, how much is is uh, it is April, isn't it? His wife. Yeah, yeah it must be knowing the uh, knowing the background. Um, always liked her in the eighties. <laughs> you know, how how much are, are are they simpatico? Are they you know are they in agreement with this? Um, because. You know, you're talking about, you know, he's only 64. You've probably got a good number of years together. Does she want him to continue working? Mm -hmm. Does she want him more of his time? You know, uh, so I think it's important to understand that. 
Um, yeah, she's got twenty uh, percent ownership, I think it is. Um, and also, like I said, you know, uh, understand the dynamic between Michael and Mitch and uh, Devon. Um, and I, other people have mentioned it, but I'd also like to know more about Kit um, and uh, what drives him. <laughs> So, Thank you for acknowledging <laughs> the effort that I've made with the name, Toby. I agree. <laughs> you can tell, you can tell, I mean, all you need to do is look at my Wikipedia history that, to tell I've, I've obviously, I should have put more detail into the actual technical to just making it funny, but yeah. it, it entertains me, mate. But the, the, um, fu the funny thing was, as soon as I read Devon Mars, it just banged it in my <laughs> mind, but I remember that name. <laughs> I, I didn't pick up on that first of all. I must be honest. Literally, literally I've had the, I've had the, I've had the theme tune on YouTube for about a week, so uh, it's been, it's been good fun. Uh, it is an amazing theme tune. Yeah. Mike, what were your final thoughts? Oh, Mike, can you unmute? Is yeah, no, I had to have, have two goes at it. Apologies for that. Um, yeah, just to slightly muddy, muddy the water. I was speaking to a, an insolvency practitioner the other day. And in terms of the asset sale versus share sale, one, people, one thing people overlook apparently is that if you have a solvent liquidation of the company, if you have an asset sale and a solvent yeah. liquidation of the company, you can then get um, entrepreneur relief yeah. on getting the money out of that business as opposed to not having a solvent liquidation. Then you have to take dividends and pay double tax and, and whatever on it. Um, a, a, Apart from that, I haven't got anything else to add. Uh, I could go into the realms of, you know, what the sale was, but then we just don't have the information on what kind of yeah. sale, whether it was a strategic sale or investment type sale. I suppose the yeah. challenge you've got with insolvency, if, if there's a range of different assets, so if you've got IP in there, if you've got recurring income in there, if you've got star, how many of those individual how long is it going to take for those individual elements to be sold in an insolvency situation i don't know i mean it might no, be a the bit insolvency more complex, would come, the insolvency would come after so they would all be gone so they, yeah. they, 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 it would be an apa type sale asset purchase agreement to be transfer the staff yeah as you say if there are too many elements that again suggests that you should be selling the shares because if you unravel too much in the you know if you've got um uh, your name registered sorry the, the uh, uh, sorry there are too many elements and too complicated to to sell by way of the, asset sell then you better best with the share sale but also the business value as you say there's there's that cost consideration but that business value you could turn around and say actually that's probably money well spent but if it's oh, a yeah, couple yeah. of hundred grand you, you, couple might hundred grand there, wouldn't, you wouldn't really be thinking about it yeah 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 fair enough sanjar have we, have we come to you mate any final results uh, yeah one thing uh, maybe uh, i would be keen to ask uh, about this new business uh, with uh, mitch and michael they have four thousand per month uh, expense now what is that expense uh, uh, is about uh, is that their salary or uh, you know just normal rent rates so maybe a breakdown of that yeah. might be helpful yeah so yeah uh, apart from that uh, yeah i think there's nothing much any of have, have i missed have i missed anybody no somebody's dog um yeah, can I just wrap something up here? Uh, we, we are living in a time of huge changes at the moment, and I think we all around this uh, group are going through it in one way or another. We're all handling it in different Some are being supported, some are not, and some are in isolation. And as a result, you know, people are going through uh, this experience in a different way. And some of the work that I've been doing is finding some people are actually on a lockdown. And lockdown, it means mentally lockdown, not just physically, in the physical environment. And the reason being, some of these were actually quite high functioning people before the lockdown. And all of a sudden, they've imploded and they're scared, they're anxious. They may not be able to show it. And, you know, it's reminding me of this uh, uh, symbol of. COVID-19 now, there are two symbols. One is a little sphere with spikes on it. 
The other one is a mask. And the analogy is that behind the mask is a person and they could be hiding their true feelings and emotions, what they're going through. And it's a question of dignity and uh, you know, credibility. So they don't want to talk about it. And as a result, it's festering within the body and it's making them ill. And I've seen some really perfectly fit people and unable to function in the, over the last few months. So I think it's really open for all of us, not just yourself, but you know, have a look around you, families, friends, business colleagues, who may have a mask on their face with a big smile, but big, deep behind, there is something that that's festering that could be really pulling them down. You know and what, Friday, but I think, I think you make an interesting point because I think we now live in a society where mental health issues uh, are more openly spoken about. Um, and I'm, I'm glad for that, but I think there's still some work to do. Um, We've got a long way yeah. to go yet. It's still a taboo because mental illness is unseen. There's no sign of it. Uh, even if you come across it, it's a discriminatory thing. It's very less un understood. Mm, no, absolutely. Right, Things thank like dementia, you. I'm working on a voluntary basis to help people with dementia. So certainly yeah. consider, you know, uh, opening up and having somebody to talk to. Uh, and if you've got, we were talking about in this case study, that if you're talking to family members, you're not going to be open to or willing to talk about your personal things without being criticized. If you have somebody impartial, who you don't have a relationship with, you're more likely to spill up and open up your can of worms and talk about it, really. Yeah, the, yeah. Really no. process physically and mentally. 100%. All right, thank you, everybody, for joining this Inner Circle. We really appreciate it. A couple of things that I need to mention. Number one is we are recording. So if you... Um, uh, and we do share it on social media. So if you've got any objections to that, uh, let Russ know or Hervé know. Um, and Russ will do an editing job and cut you out, apparently. I, I, I don't know how that works. I'll, I'll let him do it. But um, clearly, uh, if you're able to get involved and we can all share it, we can all benefit from the, uh, from the, from the marketing back and forth that goes um, goes with that. Um, and what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be reaching out to many of you here um, once I've written the white paper, number one for feedback on the white paper, but also to um, potentially um, answer the survey questions that we're going to have in it and potentially share it with people that you might be able to um, share it with clients, friends, whoever, to gate so that we can gain as much insight as possible in terms of the challenges that people at that age face. So if you if you have to do that, um, uh, I'll, I'll be in touch. If you're not, I'm relaxed, but if you're able to do that, I'll be in touch. It'd be a really interesting project that we're working on. Um, and on that note, I hope to see some of you at some point in the next couple of months face to face. <laughs> I mean, that might happen. You never That's know. Awesome. Um, and um, he, we're always here if you need a chat, so uh, it'd be good to be good to catch up soon. Uh, um, thanks again for getting involved again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, Chris. 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 Thanks, everyone. 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 Thanks, ever